There are so many reasons to be humble in this life, and uh, for me, particularly this evening, actually, to, to be back here at this stage and uh, to deliver a lecture at the opening of a master that I was a student and part of it uh, two years ago. I remember last time I took the floor to, to present something, it was to defend my thesis. So now probably I will not be judged to, uh, based on whatever I will say. And, uh, well, directors, uh, professors, uh, secretary as well, and uh, all the students, uh, it's a great honor to be here back in Istanbul, back at Pelgi, and uh, Steve, and uh, to, to share with you a lecture this evening that I'll try to make it light, uh, yet hopefully informative. Uh, and uh, allow me to start by commending this partnership between Steve and uh, uh, Belgi. I think uh, I'm one who believes that uh, the campus of university should be the globe. And there should not be a closed campus for any university because this is the point of having a university. It's about educating and uh, enlightening. And uh, I think by, by having this, we are proving a concept that these partnerships in academic institutions is extremely important. Uh, my experience at the master was very helpful, very useful, and very, uh, very special. I mean, to learn international relations not only by theories, but by, by doing and by uh, really touring around and moving and getting to see things firsthand. What I learned in Turkey here was very special for me. And uh, this is a country that uh, I'm proud uh, uh, to, to be a returning, I mean, in different capacities here all the time. And I think uh, we get to learn a lot from Turkey uh, at different fronts. And uh, so with this uh, part of introduction, I would say, to, to just express uh, how much I'm uh, grateful for this opportunity and to be back with you. Again, this will not be a thesis. Uh, it's not uh, too academic somehow, but uh, it's about the United Nations and uh, the United Nations 21st century. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a challenge to speak about youth issues. This is basically what I've been doing uh, since I joined. I start my youth work and youth activism since I was 15 years old. Uh, and with that, I'm speaking all the time in different events and different lectures. But uh, truly, I feel very special tonight. I mean, or th this is a special occasion for me to, to be back here and speaking about my mandate as Secretary General's Envoy in Youth. To start with, 2010, December 2010, uh, was in Cairo. And in Cairo, they had something called National Youth Survey. The National Youth Survey in Egypt is basically something that measuring the trends among young people in that country. And there are many countries now they're having youth surveys. One of the findings of the survey uh, was that only 4% of Egyptian youth, they participate in any voluntary work. That was a shocking number. The number even goes down to 2% for young Egyptian ladies and young women. Uh, and then uh, the minister was trying to explain the number and her justification was, well, I mean, young people are careless probably lazy, I mean, they don't care. So that the best she could came up with that time. She explained that because they are just lazy and not into, into volunteerism. Well, just two months after, I've seen, I mean, uh, thousands of hundreds of young people in this, um, Egypt to, to, to the street demonstrating, I mean, and uh, demanding dignity, human dignity, democracy, and freedom. Uh, and two things with that number that I will start uh, other points with. The, the first one is, I think that number was a sign of protest, and this is how it should be read. It was a sign of protest that there are young people participate only when they are convinced that this is a meaningful participation. And the second number, which I'm trying to avoid now, is, or the second take of that uh, number, is that uh, sometimes politicians and decision makers and takers, they fail to read numbers. They don't really understand what's happening in this youth sector. It's a very dynamic, vibrant youth generation that uh, often, I mean, not being really understood by, by the uh, political institutions. And I will come to that later. Uh, going to 2011, the Secretary General of the United Nations announced that working with and for young people, I'll just uh, explain why working with and for young people uh, is a priority for the United Nations. But look into some of the numbers that force the United Nations uh, and encourage the United Nations, I would say, to, to do more for youth. And always uh, joke about my, my title, because if you look to the United Nations, you will find majority of the envoys are being sent to conflict zones. So you'll have one for Somalia, and then voice to Syria, and then voice to Yemen, and now envoy to youth. And uh, it seems like youth are becoming a conflict in so many parts of the world. So I like to explain it this way because, uh, to be honest, uh, 
there could be a conflict uh, and a crisis if you don't invest in them with the right policies. Just giving you some background information about who we're talking to. I mean, who are we talking about as well when we talk about young people? Half of the world population under 25 years old. The number of youth who are between 15 to 24 are 1.2 billion. From 10 to 24 are 1.8 billion. This is not just a number. There are two things about it. In the history of this planet, we never had this number of young people. This is the largest generation of youth in the history. Second thing, 87% of this 1.8 billion are coming from developing countries. This is a time bomb. If you don't do more, if you don't invest more, how you can handle majority, 87% of the 1.8 billion are coming from the developing countries. This youth demographics, I mean, putting tremendous uh, challenges and uh, pressure and, and governments and policymakers and ministries and, uh, and, and all institutions to try to respond to their needs and demands. But if you look I mean, to some of the uh, figures in relation to education and employment, you will find, I mean, today's population, we have 73 million and 400,000 young people around the world who are unemployed. By the way, this number only captured, this according to ILO, and this number captured only uh, the young people who are registered as unemployed. So in fact, we don't know yet about the number of the young people who gave up I mean, the job search, or the, say the millions of them who are accepting jobs that they are overqualified and, uh, for these jobs. Or, uh, and some of the jobs, as you know, I mean, many young people are accepting uh, short-term contracts forever. And they, so, I mean, the situation of employment for young people is not, is not ideal, but uh, looking to projections to the future. In the next 15 years, there are a need for more than 425 million jobs. I know that you will not wait for 15 years. You will wait for next year, probably, to start looking for a job. Uh, and I'm not frightening you, but, I mean, this is part of what, uh, what's out there in this world. 425 million jobs, combine them with the other number, we're talking about 500 million jobs need to be created. And this is talking about the future. Speaking about other figures in terms of uh, the education system and how the quality of education that we have today. To be honest, I, I find it funny most of the time when people start talking about the mismatch between the outcomes of education and the needs of the labor market. Uh, I find it funny for, for a reason because this, mis this mismatch will continue forever. It's impossible now in our lifetime to get a degree where you expect that you'll continue working for 40 years or 50 years with the same knowledge. Things are changing constantly, and lifelong learning is extremely important. I will come how the United Nations is trying to approach this issue. But the mismatch is one thing. But I guess part of the challenges we are facing that two-thirds of the world population today are still offline offline that they don't have access to internet. We're not talking about the quality of the one-third who have I mean, uh, access to internet, because in many countries they don't have access to broadband internet. Uh, 1.3 billion around the world, they still don't have even electricity. So speaking about internet is a way luxurious thing. It's 1.3 without electricity. And these are all challenges in our world today. I know that some of you will say, well, shame. And it is a shame to be in the 21st century with 1.3 without electricity, with, with all these challenges that we are facing, and with Europe facing this unemployment crisis. I know that we debated this during my master, when I took the master, I think that you continue to, to debate this. And just the other day I was in a retreat with uh, some senior officials uh, from the European Union, and I told them I don't understand how Europe at large is not doing more for, for youth now. Because if you look to this generation in Europe, they are the most talented, I would say, and uh, the best educated generation of Europe since more than 100 years now. Uh, leaving them without uh, more investments in youth is a big challenge. I think many of them, they speak as she for languages. And they're truly talented, I mean, generation that is left to suffer and with the fact that there are no jobs out there. Uh, this leads me to, to speak about another area where I guess young people feel a uh, big challenge in relation to their representation in the political processes. I find it very interesting, to be honest, that uh, young people, do you think young people are interested in politics or not? 
I, I, I always hear all the time that young people are not interested in politics. Just open the feed and news um, and Twitter and Facebook. It's all political issues. And it's all being debated and discussed by young people. I get to realize that young people are super interested in politics, but they don't care about governments. They are not interested in governments. They are not interested in elections. They don't care about uh, political institutions, the majority, but they are yet debating political issues. This gap is, is dangerous. I mean, having this all activism in the virtual life and is not translated to political actions in the ground is something, I mean, make me again go back to the December 2010 and read the number of 2% of 4% carefully. This disconnection, this gap between young people and their virtual activism and not being translated to any political actions is something to be considered. I mean, and then we need to question here uh, about democracy. I could understand, I mean, protests in countries where the non-democratic countries could understand protests as well where the economic crisis, I mean, hit and the high unemployment rates out there. But how do you explain a country like Brazil, for example? Uh, Brazil is having the lowest unemployment rate in its history, uh, recent history, and Brazil is, is doing pretty well, and they have an elected government as well, a functioning democracy, I mean, in our terms. I think I will quote here former president of Brazil, Lula da Silva, who said something brilliant, I guess. For this generation, democracy is not a contract to silence. And this generation has no longer defined democracy as voting every four years. And I can't agree more with that. Look to what you do. You tweet, retweet, like, share, dislike, and you are debating politics. Well, yet, if you go to the real political life, it's not yet, I mean, updated to the latest version of how we are debating issues. And here, like I say that, uh, why societies entered the digital era, uh, politics and political institutions remained analog. And that's so true. If you look now, you still can vote for X Factor or I don't know which idol you are looking for, but you can vote so easily for that. And it's impossible to do the same for any political candidate, whether I mean at the national level or at the regional level or at any level. I mean, I wonder which whether we should transform young people and their trends to become a bit uh, according to the political games. It was time to reconsider about the, reconsider the governance model that we have today, about the procedures of democratic processes, and upgrade it to a level where it could capture this enthusiasm and this, uh, this new trends, especially in countries where they enjoy high penetration to internet and all that. So this, is, this remains a big question here. And force, I mean, more institutions to become more inclusive user-friendly, and to keep capture of all these trends and changes. That's one of the challenges that facing institutions in general. The United Nations is not an exception to that, as one of the institutions that in 2011 realized that need, more needs to be done, and a UN system with more than 40 entities and organizations require more coordination and more strategic way in addressing youth issues. That's why Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, in his second term, he declared youth as one of his top priorities for, and for the entire organization. There were three main initiatives here. Uh, the first was, um, you know, UNV, as we call it, United Nations Volunteer Program. Now, for the first time, this program will be open for, from 18 years old, and uh, there will be a youth modality for UNV, and it's a very ambitious one, and they encourage you, I mean, in your future as well, uh, steps after the master, you might consider this, this program. Uh, UNV is now uh, just released a new strategy for the youth modality. And it's a very good access point to the United Nations to understand how the UN works. The second, for the first time ever, we have uh, an envoy for youth issues, as I said, but also a strategy, a common strategy for the United Nations, bringing more than 40 agencies to work together in a coordinated way. This is something we call it a um, system-wide action plan, SWAB in youth. The UN likes acronyms, as you know. So, so we have more than 40 entities, and this is so ambitious a plan because it comes by coordinating more than 40 organizations. And by the UN here, I talk about UNICEF, WHO, UNESCO, ILO, UNDP, UNFBA, UN Habitat. All these organizations are part of this 
common strategy in youth issues. But when I joined IDFI, I mean, there are some, some of the shortcomings that we need to tackle. In my personal work plan, I mean, my office work plan, we identify four priority areas for the United Nations in order to do more for youth. The first one starts with participation and the fact uh, that if we would like to reach on others and to lecture as well and encourage everyone to be more inclusive, we better do it first ourselves. That's why the United Nations, for the first time, we are leading now pilot project to establish youth advisory boards for all UN country teams around the world. We just, I mean, uh, coming from Johannesburg, where we established one there. And having a youth advisory board to advise the work of the entire UN system at the national level. I'll tell you why it's very important at the national level, because this is where the, most of the budgets are being decided and allocated. At the national level as well, the programs are being designed. So having youth being part of designing these programs was very important for us. Also, we will, for the first time, and I'm happy to announce this from this platform, the United Nations will establish a United Nations panel in youth, bringing for 15 uh, experts and also uh, politicians, academics, uh, youth organizations to advise the United Nations at large in youth issues. And this is, I consider, a major step in the right directions. We will also, and through participation, uh, you know how the government of the United Nations work, and I'm sure during the master, for those who are still not very familiar, maybe you'll get to understand better how it functions from inside. They are the agency's part, but one of the important tracks in the work of the United Nations is the intergovernmental track, where member states are deciding things, whether it's through the General Assembly or the different commissions or the ECOSOC or the Security Council. And one of the gaps we used to have is the lack of youth participation inside the intergovernmental mechanism with member states when they design, when, uh, when they debate resolutions. And now we will have a specialized forum under ECOSOC. ECOSOC is the Economic and Social Council, and it's the body that is, uh, most of UN agencies are reporting to. It's the body where all issues related to economic and social issues are being discussed and debated. We will have United Nations Forum Global, global Forum, Global ECOSOC Youth Forum, where young people from all around the world will be coming with member states discussing that. We'll also, under participation, we'll have a World Youth Conference where all ministers of youth and sports around the world will be coming to meet with youth organizations, private sectors, and other actors. This is happening in Sri Lanka uh, in May next year. Also identify, I mean, the nature of youth work, as you know. If you look to many countries, you'll find, and I know in Turkey there's a, uh, a ministry, I mean, a small ministry that is coordinating among different line ministries. Uh, you have a ministry of youth and sports. In some countries you have a uh, youth council. And it's always a challenge when it comes to youth issues, because some may argue that, well, there are no youth issues. There are health issues. There are development issues, I mean, education. And youth are cross-cutting all these different areas. Uh, that might be true, partially, but the fact, I mean, development work, uh, if you mainstream something, you are always at the risk that you will lose it. It becomes everywhere and nowhere somehow. So we, we encourage the practice of having a body inside our government coordinating this with a Shoah ministry or, or youth council. And we are working to provide capacity building for most of member states. Uh, actually, speaking about uh, how we work with ministries of youth and sports, uh, something reminds me always with the uh, soft power of the United Nations. And uh, this is a term uh, you will uh, discuss in details. Uh, the soft power of the United Nations, uh, for me, I always wonder why it's called even United Nations uh, as an organization. And uh, my take, I think, is if you read the chart of the United Nations, it's a, it's a body that is mandated to United Nations based on the values that define in the uh, charter, human dignity, democracy, peace, security. And if you read and believe in these values, which we call them universal values now, these universal values represent what the United Nations is trying for. And this is part of the soft power of the United Nations. When it comes to the youth issues, if you go the, to back to the literature in the 80s and 90s, you will not find the term youth policy. It's almost not there. Nobody used to talk about youth policies. In 1995, the General Assembly of the United Nations agreed to adopt 
a document we call it the World Program for Action for Youth. And with this document, encourage all member states, it's a guiding document with 15 priority areas, encourage all member states to develop youth policies. Just from no mention even youth policies at almost in most countries, that's 1995. Now, 2013, there are more than 120 countries with youth policies. Well, we can argue about how, how the quality of these youth policies. But you see, when you put a term in the market, as we say, and you try to promote it and work hard to make it there, you see how the reaction will work. And I think this is part of the added value, and this is where the United Nations should continue to focus on supporting member states. Another area, uh, one of the challenges we face in youth work is the fact uh, there are always commitment to youth issues. I almost I have never met so far a minister of youth uh, or ambassador, even some head of state, without them mentioning all the time their commitment to youth issues. Uh, the challenge remains always, I mean, uh, translating this commitment to allocations and to financial support to youth issues. Uh, maybe many of you are interested in civil society and you will find that one of the least funded civil society groups in the world are youth-led organizations. Many see them as uh, passionate but not yet professionals. See them too young to know how to handle things or big budgets. So. And this is one of the things that the United Nations prioritizes to, to do this shift to make sure that nothing about youth without youth, to work in full partnerships with young people. That's why we just hosted last week, actually, a meeting the week before, meeting with uh, more than 120 youth organizations, some of the major youth organizations, and uh, Turkey uh, was represented there as well, uh, and networks around the world, to work with the United Nations to design our next cycle for programs. I believe that it's only by empowering, by providing more funding as support for youth-led organization, the youth issues could uh, be, I mean, taken to more, uh, a higher level at the development agenda debate. Speaking of partnerships and uh, why, uh, why this uh, system-wide action plan or the common strategy of the United Nations is of great importance for us, because, because we don't have a UN youth. We have UN women, if you know. We have uh, one of the UN agencies called UN Women. And we have UNICEF for children. We have ILO for labor. And and there are many specialized and different agencies in the UN. Yet, with a large number of young people, there are no one specialized agency for youth. And now we believe that, I mean, youth issues in particular should, you, you should not have a new agency somehow, uh, but you should enhance the interagency coordination between all agencies. And I believe to this end, I mean, uh, came my appointment to provide this political support to the interagency cooperation between the UN agencies. And by bringing most of UN agencies together at the national level in a coordinated way, we'll be able to influence governments and to work and provide the best support we can provide to governments and civil society. And that's what we call the principle of harmonization for the UN work. And if you are interested in the UN, I really encourage you to, to think about these models of uh, uh, know that you'll be studying federalism as well. And uh, there are a lot of what you will learn in federalism. You'll find it somehow uh, there and uh, some of the concepts that you can use to harmonize and to bring such a huge system at all levels to functions together. That's, that's one of the issues. Well, for the UN, and going back to some of the education and employment, some of the shifts that we believe on, and uh, we, we, we believe that should be promoted now, and go back to education. I mentioned some of the challenges we have. And because education is one of the uh, focus areas in the UN strategy in youth. Uh, under education, we believe it's time not to talk only about uh, access uh, to primary education. If you know the discourse and development for uh, many years uh, been about uh, making sure that all child are in school. And I believe that's extremely important. Even now with the MDGs, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, we made significant progress, uh, but yet there are more than 57 million children around the world outside of, of school, and they are not yet enrolled to primary education. But what you can do with the primary education? How far you can go with the primary education? One of the things that we are advocating for in the next development agenda, that is, we call it post-2015 development agenda, which should be coming after the MDGs uh, come to an end in 2015, 
to advocate for not only talking about access to primary education, but it's time to talk about access to post-primary education. And I would say not only access, because you can't be in a school without learning anything, but time also to tackle the issue of quality education. So it's access to quality post-primary education. And with that, I'm, I'm mainly concerned in my mandate about uh, the transition from education to work. And with that, I think we still need to do more to, uh, to think about the informal education and support that, vocational training. There are some successful examples around the world where this dual program and system is functioning very well, I mentioned Germany here. And I think it's time to focus on that and time to try to, to not only give education for the past. And I'm personally very concerned about this because education is being downgraded in so many countries around the world because it's no longer for many uh, a door opener. It doesn't open door for many. And uh, of course, I, I disagree with this. But many, they see it this way. They see where you get a good education and you end up nowhere without a good job and uh, without even a possibility to, to, uh, to get a decent job opportunity. I think, I mean, by focusing more on enhancing the quality of education and by providing education that is relevant to the future, not only to the past, that education system that allow you to uh, teach you how to think, not what to think all the time. I think that's the future of education that we need, and this is the shift that will allow the post-2015 development agenda to be, to be relevant. This shift of, of a great importance, not only for the students themselves, but also for education system itself, for the academic institution. An education system that is not really opening doors for the future will be, will be a ch big challenge for all actors in the, in the academic formula. Speaking about the job opportunities, I mentioned the number 73 million. Uh, I think who can create 500 million jobs in the next 15 years? Who is able? Governments alone? Private sector? In the UN, we promote partnership, PPP, I mean, private-public partnerships. Uh, and uh, I think this is, could contribute to solve the problem. But I think that also will not be able to, to tackle, I mean, this demographic uh, pressure that we'll have in the future with more than 500 million jobs. As I said, majority of them are coming from developing countries. Just think about Africa. Africa, in the next 20 years, the number of young people will double. And they already have all these troubles and problems now. So this is even, I mean, bigger challenge for Africa in the future. So what is the alternative here? What we promote is the fact that the future of education and job search should not be about job seekers looking for jobs, but should be about job innovators and people who are inventing their jobs. That's why I always, I mean, when I meet the Minister of Education, I tell them I wish now we can introduce not only how to write a nice resume, but how to write a business plan. And how many schools around the world will teach you how to write a business plan? I mean, especially, I mean, high schools. Uh, uh, School. I think this is what should be introduced now. The fact about making this shift to not only seeking jobs, but also to invent jobs, and this will be part of the solution. This is the only way forward. By taking risk, by creating jobs, you will be able I mean, to be self-employed, but you will create jobs for others as well. And this is a starting point for me, because a man, a young man or woman without job, uh, that's a severe, I mean, psychological damage, I would say for a young person who's uh, in his 20s or her 20s and waking up every day without uh, having any place to go. Uh, it goes by end numbers. I mean, it's really a psychological damage for anyone. So I think we really need to introduce and, uh, a more uh, progressive way of looking for allowing young people to innovate their jobs. But uh, is it that easy? I, I don't think so. I think, I mean, uh, this shift needs to happen at different uh, scales. One of them, I mean, when we call, I mean, young people to become young entrepreneurs, or I ask them to do, uh, is whether we are providing them with the necessary support. I just mentioned three levels here, where it's impossible for a young entrepreneur, it's not impossible, but it's really difficult for a young entrepreneur to survive, if, first, you have a legal framework that is absolutely not supportive. I can't understand how we can encourage young entrepreneurs uh, if we are taxing them from day one, for example. I mean, how a small business can survive with being taxed with all these complications to open a new business? 
So a legal framework that is more supportive for small businesses is important. Second, whether we are providing financial services for young people. And looking to that, uh, something that we continuously pro I mean, promote at the United Nations, for all financial institutions, banks, to provide access to credit for young people. How you can be able to really, I mean, uh, access a credit, I mean, to, to start a business without having any access to credit. Right? This is one of the challenges. Number three, and this is remain a big challenge, I guess, is uh, by ensuring that we have informal education system that is willing to support young entrepreneurs to go up from the, uh, to scale up their businesses and uh, provide them with the necessary coaching and support. This is, I mean, part of the shifts that we need to take. And I believe the United Nations has made it uh, very clear at the national level with many governments that we are ready to provide all technical support required to that. We have our uh, uh, agency, ILO, International Labor Organization, are leading in that. And uh, in fact, soon we will have a joint op-ed for me and with the ILO director, I mean, talking about exactly the shifts needed to support young people and young entrepreneurs. Because um, 500 million jobs, and, and even the, at the United Nations now, and I'm sure many of you followed some of the developments last week uh, during the General Assembly. I'm, I'm so proud of the United Nations at this time, and we all felt so proud, actually, that major progress has been made this year at the General Assembly. I quote Ban Ki-moon, actually, the Secretary General, who said uh, for his stay, I mean, during the past seven years, this has been the most successful General Assembly he attended. Things moved at all fronts. It moved from um, India and Pakistan to Iran and uh, the United States. It moved, I mean, also with the uh, Syrian crisis. And, but I was personally so amazed by a fact that I attended some of the speeches at the General Assembly. And the main stage was always about development. It was, I mean, going back and forth with different issues, but the main issues that were debated there it was development issues and the question of MDGs and post-2015 development agenda. With that, I would like to, take a, to talk a bit about the post-2015 development agenda. Uh, always, I mean, because I'm so much into the topic, I don't know at what level, uh, how familiar you are, I would say, I mean, with the post-2015 development agenda. But as you know, the MDGs uh, has been maybe the most successful uh, poverty elevation project in the history of the human beings so far. Uh, made the important progress with the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, since 2000 till now. And with this success, I think everybody concerned and, uh, about what will succeed the MDGs and what we will have after uh, 2015. And the big question here, which kind of development agenda? And as you are starting your master, I would really encourage you uh, not to leave this debate. Uh, be part of it and uh, vote, I mean, share your concerns. But also, if you have a one year to research, I would uh, try to convince you as well to consider the MDGs or post-MDGs uh, and this big debate around uh, the new development agenda and the interests of different groups. And it's a really big debate. I mean, I maybe personally so far in seven months, I've been to more than 50 or 60 events around the MDGs and post-MDGs. So what I want to share with you, why the post-2015 development agenda and uh, the new development agenda for the world is important. Uh, I'm one of the people who argued the United Nations that we should not call it agenda, in fact. Uh, agenda is a bit of a relaxing for me. I think it should be, and you all heard of the term social contract. For me, the MDGs or post-MDGs should be development contract in this sense. Because the fact now, we are not only citizens of our countries. Uh, you are not only a citizen of Turkey or Jordan or France and I believe we are all, we have a dual citizenship, but uh, we are global citizens as well. As a citizen, you have the right to vote, uh, to, to participate in elections and to, as a global citizen, you do have the same right to do, to make your voice here than to be part of this big development debate around the world, which is reflected now by the post-2015. I call it contract because I really believe that it's uh, by uh, doing the shifts that we need to do from the, drawing the lesson from the MDGs, and by making sure that uh, poverty could be elevated and some of the diseases could be fought, and uh, I wish that it will be a, a real war in uh, poverty and, and, and diseases. And I think we could achieve more uh, with the MDGs, the current MDGs. But the post-2015 development agenda is a very important issue and being debated at all levels 
And I think for you academic studies and for your even uh, research this year, this is an issue that will be of extreme importance that will keep you up to date with what's happening around the world because it tackles almost everything from energy to, to uh, poverty. Climate change is a big issue as well. Here, I mean, this post-2015 development agenda represents for the United Nations our coming contract, I would say, for development work. Uh, but it's not only the job of the United Nations, up to my beliefs. I think the United Nations at the end has its limitations and uh, uh, its capacity to deliver. You know that the United Nations has less employees than McDonald's, for example. McDonald's, uh, I mean, or, or and Burger King, they have more than the United Nations. I'm not sure about Starbucks, but um, at least this, uh, two, they have more than the United Nations. And in terms of budgets, uh, the city of New York has more budget than the United Nations as well. That's hosting us. And you see what, what this uh, resources. And we are being asked every year to cut and cut, and this is a uh, fact. Uh, uh, it's not to mean hindering that. Of course, it puts some impediments for the work of the United Nations. But I think all this delivery, you are seeing it with uh, really, I mean, uh, budget that, uh, in general, I mean, 8% eight, eight only the, of, uh, of the military spending around the world is being spent on aid. Uh, I mean, from aid for any, any cause. And some few billions of dollars, a few millions, could really do magic. I mean, could do, uh, tackle some of the big development issues. And Personally, I'm so proud to be part of an organization that is promoting these things and trying to remind all governments all the time of the needs for, for, for bringing and joining forces and prioritizing development issues uh, as the big challenge facing all of us. Uh, speaking about the limits of the United Nations, it's important because I, in seven months I went to 16, 17 countries so far. And uh, I remember a bright young man from uh, Senegal uh, in the car. He told me, well, what's wrong with you? I mean, we don't see the United Nations here. I uh, don't see any of the United Nations. And I told him, well, good for you, in fact, because uh, if you want to see us in the street, it means that there's a crisis going here. And this is where we deliver our services ourselves. The UN is not a service provider, but we are forced to provide services all the time due to all the challenges uh, that I just described. But in the ideal world, we should work with governments, with civil society, to strengthening the institutions to provide this international experience to the table and to enhance the deliveries of national governments and also of the, of the civil society. And I think this is, might be the added value always of the United Nations, where the UN had, I mean, to do other functions due to the instability and the, the, the problems that we are facing around the world. There are me, the, uh, with post-2015, uh, I would like to conclude this, and maybe we can have more time uh, for Q&A and days uh, and general discussion. But um, honestly, my, my main message to you today that, I mean, uh, the United Nations is, is moving now, I would say, in, uh, in the right direction. Most of what I just uh, said and many other information available online, uh, un.org slash youth envoy is the website, and it's a one-stop shop for all youth-related information, the UN system from all agencies, all departments. You will find them in one place. Uh, and so it's a way to get more information about what's happening in the system and how you can work with the United Nations. There are many issues that we could be uh, discussing, but uh, most of these, I mean, the system-wide action plan, the UN strategy in youth is available online, and I'm one of the speakers who cannot find himself, I mean, explaining his strategies for audience, because I think this is one of the most boring things you can do. Uh, nobody will follow you when you explain strategies. I mean, maybe you can explain the guidelines for them, but it's a very detailed one. And I think the UN is really leading global momentum uh, for, for youth uh, uh, around the world and youth, youth development. And uh, just some of the things that we hosted recently, I mean, uh, the global compact, which uh, bring together uh, some of the leaders of the business world and the major companies. And we're discussing with them the need that for them to do more for youth. I spoke just a few weeks ago with the Broadband Commission, where some of the richest men in the world and uh, heads of the telecommunication companies, they came together and agreed that they will, uh, they will establish together a fund and they will increase their funding to ensure that uh, more young people around the world have access to Internet. I'm, I'm one of the people who personally, whenever I travel, I feel this all the time, that it's impossible now to speak about uh, a same word for all of us, about agenda and universal agenda for all of us, 
uh, with, with two thirds of the population, world population, I mean, it's still offline. Uh, I, I used to be encouraged even uh, uh, by the fact that 6.8 billion out of the 7 billion, uh, they have uh, subscriptions to, to mobile. Uh, and then I get to realize at the Broadband Commission that in fact the unique users are only 3.3 billion. So we are even not uh, half of the world in terms of subscriptions to mobile. This we are talking about TG, 2G network. So uh, this is another uh, challenge facing uh, the development in the future. Uh, I will not leave with a negative tone. I think uh, there are great uh, opportunities uh, uh, coming. And I, I truly believe that uh, with, uh, with the next cycle of development agenda, we are able to, uh, to address some of these uh, big challenges. And I, as always, describe for... for my colleagues in the UN system, uh, they like to talk about youth under development, and I tell them, uh, no, let's talk about youth as under peace and security in the United Nations, uh, because it's a peace and security issue for the future. And uh, what, what globe you can sustain, or what stability we can talk about with having half of the world population, uh, and, and with sometimes some of them, as you know, in um, uh, conflict zones with no even prospects to the future, and uh, that's a big challenge for all of us. Uh, I, I'm so encouraged by the commitment, I mean, of uh, different departments and agencies in the UN, by the realization of many donor agencies to prioritize youth, uh, yet uh, we need to do more. And uh, I think uh, I've tried here to present some of the very general information about our direction, some of our priorities, and uh, uh, our collective thinking, I would say, in the United Nations, how to tackle this issue. Thank you so much. You mentioned during the speech some challenges which the youth faces today, but what do you believe over the next decade or two decades will be the major issue that the youth will face in the world, developing and developed countries? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, do you watch science fiction movies? <laughs> yeah, okay. I think... I think some of them could answer because uh, you have you have a question. I think there are scarce resources, as you know. I mean, uh, especially speaking about the water conflict that is coming ahead, and many of the issues that we're talking about today is uh, affecting youth and all citizens around the world. One issue that strikes me the most, I would say, is the, the issue of climate change and sustainability in general. You know, if we continue to consume as we do today, we need the sheep planets to accommodate us. I mean, she. And this is impossible. I like, I mean, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations who always say uh, they always a plan B, but there is no planet P. So you better figure it out here and now with, with addressing the climate change issue. I'm sure that you will have some of uh, enlightening lecture, I mean, uh, uh, with, with the climate change negotiations and the history of this. And we're coming next year with a big summit as well, coming with the, uh, the Secretary General trying to push for a globally binding agreement for climate change next year. A person will be uh, working with him in the effort to, to mobilize civil society groups for that, and uh, I encourage you to follow this. I think the climate change issue is, is indeed a big, a big challenge facing all of us. I mentioned I mean, some projections to the future in terms of uh, job uh, opportunities uh, and others. And uh, allow me here to add the issue of, uh, I mentioned science fiction, and uh, I'm uh, this morning at an uh, event, uh, Dr. Tobias, about uh, peace in the Middle East, and uh, and this morning I was thinking, I told the special envoy of the Secretary General to, to, to the Middle East. Uh, I told him, uh, I wish we started dreaming about uh, political fiction as well, uh, social fiction, uh, and that things that we will think and we think it's impossible, that will be true in a couple of years, as most of the science fiction movies in the 70s, uh, they turned to be something achievable. So peace in the Middle East might be a social fiction for many, or political fiction, uh, that's something not achievable. But I really believe that, as Muhammad Yunus, uh, you know him very well, Professor Muhammad Yunus, uh, he said, <coughs> let's send poverty to, to the museum. Uh, we can, we can do it. I mean, uh, and I really believe in him and believe that this is something that you can send to the museum, something that you can really elevate to the point that no, people will not understand what does poverty mean. So you can go to museum to... <laughs> to see what, what is poverty. And I think it was the same with some of the challenges. Uh, I, I will add one more thing. Lack of uh, sense of urgency for the, some of the issues we are facing today is one of the challenges for, for the future. Because most of the challenges that we'll face in the future 
uh, it will not be tackled in the future. It's, it's time is now. If you don't do more now, you will probably will be in really big trouble in the future. So I, I doubt, I mean, whether we, we do have this sense of urgency that it's really, I mean, these are urgent issues that require coordinated and, uh, and most of them are global challenges. It's not up to, to one member state or government to solve them. I mean, most of the challenges we are facing from terrorism to, to climate change uh, cross borders and they are global by nature and only by promoting global responses to them and by commitment to translate these responses. One thing you mentioned, criticizing the UN all the time, I just came from Johannesburg with an amazing youth event where the young people have to vote about uh, what their views of the United Nations, if they think it's relevant or not. Majority thought, I mean, the, the voting came as United Nations as uh, dysfunctional. I mean, it's not functioning uh, very well. But then they have WHO, World Health Organization. 98% they thought is functioning very well. UNICEF, functioning very well. I just, <laughs> I, I, think, I think this explained to me how much, I mean, politics is overshadowing the, the, the real work of the United Nations. And in my hope, I mean, that we could push the development work to the top of the agenda because that's all one United Nations. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. I have a more personal question. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, we felt your passion for the United Nations, and I would like to know why this passion for the United Nations, and since when? I, I worked with the United Nations before in Iraq, in fact. Uh, that was, I mean, uh, the Iraq Office of UNFP, that was back in 2008. Uh, but I, I'll tell you, I think I worked in the Arab League as well, which is a similar uh, at a regional level organization, intergovernmental organization. I get to understand as well, what does it mean to work in a secretariat of intergovernmental organization where the power is for member states and you are trying to, to build consensus somehow, to, to, to be in that position. I get to see, I mean, uh, I uh, often I mean, describe working for intergovernmental organization as a balanced act between uh, uh, frustration management and expectations management because uh, inside the room you are with members, we are with different actors, and sometimes you don't really get what you think is the right thing, but this is, I mean, the aim of building consensus. But building a consensus is a, it's a painful thing. I mean, having 193 countries and reaching agreement around something is not an easy job. Uh, but then, I mean, with this, whatever frustration you have, you are asked to go out of this room, you will find media, and you will find, uh, I mean, civil society, and you need to manage their expectations because for me, I really believe that the United Nations is the best we have got so far with all, any criticism you may have. Uh, tell me where else in the world uh, with all these conflicts, 131 heads of states, they came to New York and they debate things where just a week before we thought we were going to war, a week before the General Assembly. Now it's a history, it's not even there. Where else it could happen? I mean, uh, otherwise we can debate each other by tanks in the streets. I mean, this is uh, uh, how it works. That's when it comes to peace and security. I mean, but truly, my passion is, is in development issues. Uh, development issues, I mean, by figures, by numbers, by percentage, I mean, there are remarkable progress has been made uh, over the last uh, few years. And uh, this organization is really providing the, uh, facilitating the sharing of information and knowledge and best practices around the world. So uh, there are so many reasons to... to be into this organization and to, to believe in the organization. I'm not saying it functions all the time as it should be. I'm not saying that there's not, uh, no room for, for improvement. I do believe that uh, there are huge room for, for improvement in the organization. Uh, but this is part of what you, uh, how intergovernmental organization function. I mean, uh, there are always limitations. There are always pressure. But uh, again, expectations management versus uh, frustration management. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. The fact that you said that uh, young people are actually commenting on the internet about politics and they're very passionate about it left me with the feeling that um, our political system and institutions are kind of outdated. So how do you think that um, this huge gap that you said uh, could be overcome and w how we personally could be involved into that since we are the youth of today? I really believe that young people should participate in politics. Even if you are frustrated with everyone, with everything, you should still run and be part of politics. I, I, I understand, I mean, some young people, they think, uh, uh, I mean, I'll not give my vote to anyone. Nobody deserves it. Then run yourself. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, there's no other way to do it. I think, really, I mean, young people should be organized. 
by this, I'm, I'm trying to encourage young people and work with them to, to the fact that they really have to be part of decision-making and political processes. While on the other hand, I understand that is, uh, is not, I mean, uh, the political institutions are not funky enough for this generation in a way. It's a bit, I mean, uh, as I said, it's an analog process that is uh, not appealing for many young people to be part of it. Uh, and here, I mean, the future of democracy, I mean, I really believe in democracy. I think it's only in democracy where you have uh, all these chicken balances where you, uh, so, I mean, uh, India, uh, American could be, I mean, a president of Bolivia or a metal worker can become a president of Brazil. And uh, I mean, uh, these are great things about democracy, but democracy should evolve uh, over time and political institutions should do the same. So there's a homework to do for the political institutions. I think by only making sure that young people becoming part of this, you will be able to fix a lot of things. Uh, the future of democracy will not be about this long lines of people waiting. For me, democracy is about uh, double P's, huh? procedures and principles. Procedures are meant to protect these principles. But when you have democracies becoming very much about the procedures themselves, about voting the same, I think that's, uh, that's really taking sometimes the spirit of it. So the future is about, I mean, coming to young people and engage them. I don't understand why you can't vote using the internet or why you can't uh, uh, be part of these political processes. And it's the 21st century. It's time to, to figure out some new tools for engaging this generation. Otherwise, it, it will be, there will be disconnections. So back to your question, two, two homeworks needs to be done, one for youth and youth organization, youth groups to better organize themselves, to influence politics. Uh, if you are, I, my first background is a programmer, see a computer information system, and I really believe that uh, politics is an uh, open code thing. I mean, uh, anybody can join and, and write, but you need certain skills, and you really need to know how you can play with this, uh, this open code. The other hand, I think, is a share of governments to, to try to adapt and to transform the political institution to a more inclusive, uh, and more user-friendly institutions. So you started your lecture and ended your lecture uh, stating the staggering fact that two-thirds of the world youth population uh, mm -hmm. is currently offline. Uh, what steps uh, in the 21st century do you and the UN plan to take to get uh, that two-thirds of the youth online and educate and remedy the situation? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Uh, I just mentioned the uh, Broadband Commission, which was uh, in, uh, held in New York two weeks ago, uh, where, uh, name it, I mean, m most of the big companies and telecommunication companies around the world were gathered there, and uh, uh, the UN, I mean, could not do things alone. I mean, we understand this by only partnering with them, and that's why UNESCO and the ITU, uh, they created together this Broadband Commission to bring uh, all these leaders of uh, the telecommunication sector and uh, understand that's only by promoting partnership. And this, uh, I, I believe it's not only, a, it's not an ideology, I mean, to support that. It's a business model for them, I mean, the future. These are customers. I mean, you don't really need to convince a business owner to invest in the future and to increase their bases. Uh, so I guess, I mean, that one hand. What, what there is, they are still faced with uh, some challenges. I mean, a uh, conflict zone here and there, some corruption in some places. Uh, so to to allow them to provide a, a affordable uh, solutions, that's uh, that's a big challenge uh, for them sometimes. But what the United Nations is doing, and uh, I, I mainly was part of uh, person I took part in the discussion with the in the south of Sudan, where some of the telecommunication companies came and they were discussing. I mean, uh, that we're not getting the support we need in order to grow our businesses. Uh, and you come, I mean, to know the story and the context of South of Sudan. I think it's time for that particular country, I mean, for even the UN to, to transform its work from emergency mindset to more development and long-term planning. Uh, but to speaking of where are these, I mean, uh, two-thirds living and uh, trying to profile them and to see exactly what, what kind of areas uh, will, will answer part of these questions. There is no one size for soul to do that. Uh, but having this all leader coming together, uh, they are all... Uh, determined to do more and uh, working very closely with the United Nations. And again, part of, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm just promoting the UN here today and uh, I was not planning to do that. Uh, I'm trying to tell you what the United Nations uh, actually is doing. But honestly, I mean, having all these people coming responding to the call of the United Nations and for them to explain to them what is the scene now, I mean, what are the challenges, and ask them to think beyond their 
uh, operations and to think of their responsibility globally, not only to their customers, but at large, is something that the United Nations and sometimes only the United Nations can do. Dear Ahmed, I would be delighted if we could dedicate one of the last moments of our debate to uh, a topic that's very familiar to you, to the Arab Spring. You're coming from Jordan, you, we are in Istanbul in Turkey, mm. you lived in Egypt, and um, I would be delighted if you could um, inform us about your perception. How do you believe, how do you analyze the current situation of young people in Northern Africa? It's, it's a, unfortunately, I mean, uh, it's a very tough transition. Speaking about young people, I mean, uh, you know, personally, I was, I mean, uh, I was living in Egypt during the uh, 2011, during the revolution. So from day one to day 18, during the revolution, I was there, even after the uh, revolution. And you see that momentum. And uh, I think one of the challenges uh, and uh, that lead to bigger frustration among young people is the fact uh, that they were in the driver. I mean, the, the driving force somehow for the events, uh, yet they never managed to be in the driver's seat. And uh, with all this, uh, and they're being always driven to, to, to areas and uh, to, to directions that they were not necessarily happy about. Uh, speaking about the stability of the region, I guess uh, uh, there is no, no, no sustainable way to, for the future without an inclusive political process for everyone. Uh, and this is part of democracies. I mean, uh, to do democracy and democratization uh, is not uh, an action or event. Uh, fortunately, we tend to forget that. I mean, believe uh, for me, democracy is about a process, and democratization is, uh, is a long process. It, it's not an event. It cannot be one event. And uh, maybe with some naivety, we went to the streets. I mean, I'm speaking now as a citizen of that region with understanding that one event could bring democracy. But it's a process. And this process, I mean, uh, requires Democrats as well, and people who will stay true to their principles and values, and they continue to fight for them. Uh, the United Nations has been, I mean, uh, in this process supporting and uh, by providing expertise, by uh, also, I mean, uh, taking actions uh, whenever that's needed. And uh, uh, I believe it's really up to the people in the region to, to know that uh, at the long term, I mean, the, you cannot have... Uh, a political process that is not inclusive to everyone. And uh, part of this uh, young generation now in the region with all these talents and with all this, uh, most of them, they enjoy really high access to, to technologies. Uh, the question will remain for the future uh, about uh, how inclusive the political process uh, will be. Uh, and also about uh, uh, not ending up, I mean, having kind of a revolving door somehow for what are the, the, the current events, but making sure that uh, things are, and the events are moving forward and uh, making sure that uh, uh, building the democratic experience of the Arab region that is happening, and especially uh, in, nor in North Africa. At the, at the short term, uh, we can take them country by country because uh, this is maybe could be uh, to characterize the region at large, but I mean, The situation in different countries is uh, very much different, as you know. And uh, uh, well, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned about young people in these uh, countries, I guess it's, uh, uh, they are, will continue to be, I mean, somehow not well represented in this uh, political process. I think more needs to be done to, to ensure that their immediate needs are being addressed, uh, jobs, education, uh, healthcare system, which could uh, lead them in, uh, in a mass of thinking, I mean, to think of... Uh, More, more issues about their political participation. Uh, another issue, and uh, you know, I think it's uh, building a environment, civil society in the region is very important, uh, along with bringing investments. Uh, and this, uh, neither the uh, healthy civil society and media uh, or uh, private sector could uh, flourish under uh, political instability, and it's very much needed, I mean, to start with the building consensus in the regions. and. In most of these countries, the social contracts uh, that they used to have is, uh, is very much challenged now, and uh, it's a biggest struggle to define the identity and uh, uh, what uh, so many interesting topics waiting for you. I mean, uh, I think uh, I want to do the master again, if you will. Just <laughs> <laughs> so, I would like uh, in a few words to thank you so much. Uh, I'm so honored and humbled to be back here. It's, uh, it's a great honor and privilege to... to I have spent this year with you, with Thief, and with uh, the semester in Belgium, and uh, learned a lot. I think uh, you will learn a lot from the professors and from all the guest uh, speakers, uh, but you will learn a lot from each other as well. So try to squeeze each other somehow with the knowledge you have. Um, it's learning uh, really from um, many 
uh, different nationalities, uh, you get to spend this time together, enjoy it, and uh, uh, it's a master to uh, to remember, indeed, and not only to, to carry with you. So, uh, all the best. All the best. Thank you very much.